a special episode of Red Table Talk, Bobby Brown broke his silence about the loss of his son, Bobby Brown Jr. He bravely opened up about his loss and spoke about the guilt he feels as a parent and the effects his decisions have had on his children. Bobby gave a strong warning to viewers about the dangers of black market drugs and gave insight into what he believes truly happened to his daughter, Bobby Christina. Here are the tragic details of Bobby Brown, an icon and living legend of R&B and New Jack Swing. Robert Barrasford Brown was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1969. His mother, Carol, was a teacher and his father, Herbert James Brown, was a construction worker. Bobby is the second youngest of six siblings. He was one of the few kids in his neighborhood whose parents were still together. He grew up in Roxbury and lived in the Orchard Park projects. Roxbury is the home of Funky Fresh Records, a rap label and record store, and the town is considered the epicenter of black culture in Boston. Bobby was born with music in his blood. His mother used to sing in a band with Bobby's uncle, who he was named after, but his main musical influence was his grandmother. He would go to his grandmother's apartment, which was just below his, and stay there all day, listening to her vast record collection. It was his way of escaping his noisy, chaotic household. He was a huge Michael Jackson fan growing up, and the Jackson 5 was a huge influence on him and his siblings. They all sang and dreamed of being the Boston version of the Jackson 5, even though there were four girls and two boys. Bobby's main influence was funk. He would listen to James Brown, Rick James, Bootsy Collins, and Parliament Funkadelic, to name a few. Funk is what inspired Bobby to get up and dance every day. He naturally began to develop his dance moves. His main fan was his grandmother. Seeing Bobby dance brought her great joy. This would drive him to entertain and be a crowd pleaser later in life. In the 1980s, rap music came on the scene. Funny enough, one of Bobby's early rap influences was a blonde, slender white woman named Debbie Harry, the lead singer of the group Blondie. Their song Rapture was the first rap song Bobby had ever heard. This song was influenced by rapper and DJ Grandmaster Flash. Debbie even shouted him out. In 1981, Rapture was the first US number one single to feature rap vocals. Who knew? This song would also be sampled multiple times by different hip hop, R&B and pop artists. Grandmaster Flash is credited for pioneering rap music in New York City. In 1979, the Sugar Hill Gang had the first rap single to reach top 40 on the Billboard Hot 100 with their hit, Rapper's Delight. Bobby was heavily influenced by Grandmaster Flash and adopted a rap persona based on his name. He called himself Flash B. He said, quote, I fully embraced the new music with its aggressive pulsating sound and potent style. I couldn't get enough, end quote. Fans would later get to hear Bobby rap in many of his iconic songs. He grew up in a very rich time for music with new musical genres and styles of expression. Music was not put into a box back then, whether racially or by genre. Funk, rock, rap, disco, punk even. There were no boundaries. Little did Bobby know, he would go on to meet many of his favorite artists and himself become a music icon. He would even receive bass guitar lessons from Rick James himself. Imitating other artists was how he started getting into performing. He also developed his dance skills at a very young age. At just three years old, Bobby got on stage at a James Brown show. He stole the show and from then on, he wanted to be a performer. In the 80s, kids had a lot more freedom. In Roxbury, they would hang out on the streets and go wherever they wanted without adult supervision. There was a lot of violence, crime and danger out there, but Bobby tried to avoid fighting. Instead, he battled with his dance moves. He would battle other kids at block parties and soon became known as one of the best dancers in town. While watching Soul Train, he saw someone doing the moonwalk. He mastered it and was never beaten in a dance battle again, ever. Even when he went to New York, he was unbeatable. That's when he knew he really had something special. 
Bobby was close to both of his parents and grew up in a loving home. But of course, like any other family, they had their problems, especially living in the projects. His father was a huge influence in his life. He would take him and his siblings around town and show them all the buildings he had worked on. They were all proud of their father's accomplishments and hard work. Bobby's mother was a caring and generous person who would cook for people and invite them into her home if they were having a hard time. Carol was also the disciplinarian in the family. They were a close family who stuck together no matter what. This would go on to be important for the tough times ahead. Bobby's mother led a secret double life. She was a good cook and would sell dinner plates in the hood to make some extra money. Bobby's mother taught him how to cook at a young age. His specialty was fried chicken. One day he decided to make some and seasoned and covered his chicken with flour before putting them in hot oil. When he finished, he took a bite and started to feel funny. His mother walked in, happy to see him making dinner. When she smelled it and saw powder everywhere, she was horrified. He had just made cocaine chicken. When Bobby was 10, his mother got into a confrontation with a police officer. Bobby witnessed this while he was looking out of the window. He saw one of the officers hit his mother in the face with a club and put her into the police car. He said he harboured a serious dislike of the police from that moment on. It was revealed that his mother had been selling drugs for several years. None of the kids knew and he believes even his father was unaware. With his mother in jail and his dad working, Bobby and his sister had to go to a social service centre where they stayed for a week. In his book, Every Little Step, My Story, Bobby reveals that while he was there in the centre, a priest tried to molest him. He punched him and escaped. But he had to stay at the centre for the rest of the week, stuck there and desperate to leave. Bobby said that this incident affected him well into his adulthood. He even grew resentful towards his father for failing to protect him. He didn't tell a soul about what had happened to him. Bobby also revealed on Red Table Talk that both his parents were alcoholics. This is something that would affect him too, as an adult, and make Bobby determined to break the cycle. One of the pivotal moments in Bobby's life that prompted him to leave Boston and start his group New Edition was seeing his best friend get stabbed to death. While leaving a party, Bobby's friend Jimmy got into a fight with another kid over a bike. In his neighbourhood back then, there were some racial tensions between Puerto Rican and black kids. Jimmy, an experienced brawler, was winning the fight and landing some blows. A knife was handed to the kid he was fighting and Jimmy eventually ended up getting stabbed in the chest. Bobby ran to get help, but it was too late. By the time the ambulance had arrived, Jimmy had passed away. That was the first time Bobby had ever seen someone die right in front of him. Speaking of the effect this had on him, Bobby said, after Jimmy died, I almost ceased functioning. I sat in the pouring rain on the curbside outside our building for two days straight, barely moving. My tears mixing with the water flowing in the gutter. I stared down the block, thinking that Jimmy was gonna turn the corner at any moment on his bike heading towards me, wearing a grin. I sobbed so long and hard that my chest hurt. My eyes could no longer summon tears. I didn't even move to use the bathroom. I just held onto the pole on the street, clutching it like it had the power to bring Jimmy back." End quote. As racial tensions worsened after Jimmy's death, more kids in Bobby's neighborhood were killed. Bobby said kids ignorantly believed their enemies were the kids on the other side of the projects or from other projects across town. There was more violence, more fighting and more deaths. He decided that if he wanted to see his 18th birthday, he would have to get out of there. His way out was music. New addition. Bobby joined a dance troupe with Michael Bivens, who he met at the local boys and girls club. The troupe was called Transitions. They ended up leaving because the other members were much older than them. At one point, Bobby thought he was going to be the next Muhammad Ali. He even had a fight lined up at the Golden Gloves. But his mother shut that down. You're going to be a singer, she said. And that was that. 
Bobby was approached by a local singer named Maurice Starr. He was looking to put a group together. He asked Bobby to get some friends who could sing background. He gathered Michael Bivens, of course, Ricky Bell and Ralph Tresvant, who he played basketball with. There was also Travis Pettus, but he had to go away for the summer. Michael Jackson's Off The Wall was dominating the charts. All the kids wanted to sound like him. Bobby thought he sounded the most like Michael until he heard Ralph sing. Ralph sounded exactly like Michael and blew everyone away. Bobby was cool with taking a step back and letting Ralph take the lead. He was cool being the best dancer of the group anyway. They performed for the first time at the Hyatt and they were a huge hit. They began practicing regularly and even got a choreographer. This was not just a hobby, they were serious, developing good work ethic even as kids. Maurice Starr organised local talent shows and he had one called the Hollywood Talent Night. The boys performed together again at a competition and the grand prize was a recording contract. They put on an amazing performance but were still beat by some tall lanky rappers. Thankfully, Maurice wanted to record some music with them anyway. He was a singer, writer and producer, so he knew what he was doing and they trusted him. They considered themselves a new edition of the Jackson 5 and their name was born. The first song they recorded was Jealous Girl, then they recorded Candy Girl. One day they randomly heard Candy Girl on the radio. It was played on a college radio station which was part of Northeastern University. Bobby was just 13 years when this happened. He and the others hadn't even signed a record contract or management deal. They were just doing what they were told. Whenever they weren't in school, they were performing. When their song was played on KISS FM, as far as they were concerned, they were big time. Candy Girl sold well, reaching number one in the R&B charts and selling lots of copies worldwide. They even had their first overseas visit to the UK and Germany. While in London, they all got sick because they weren't used to the food. After a couple of days in London, we all got sick from the food, Bobby said. We were desperate for McDonald's or anywhere we could find a familiar hamburger. Ralph got so sick, he couldn't do Top of the Pops. So Bobby sang lead, but wasn't feeling great himself. They hated being in an unfamiliar place. Despite it being London and not the mountains of the Himalayas, they struggled as it was the first time they had ever left the US and they were also very young. They started doing shows in New York City every weekend. Then they would get dropped back to their school in Roxbury. They would go straight to school after riding the bus all night. They performed in the early hours of the morning, well past their bedtimes, working from 12 midnight to 4 a.m. Bobby's mother began to question why the boys weren't receiving any compensation for their work, yet doing multiple shows and working for hours on end. At a young age, Bobby was exposed to the pitfalls of the industry. They were simply not being paid for their work and in proportion to the sales of their records. Of course, the first person the parents sought answers from was Maurice, but they found out that he had signed the group over to another company and it was out of his hands. He too wasn't making any money. They didn't even know how many units they had sold. In those days, there was a weird expectation for artists to get ripped off. They were even told to expect this, like it was some sort of rite of passage. There were tensions in New Edition from the very beginning. But they have stood the test of time because they weren't a manufactured group. Unlike acts where random people are thrown together just because they meet a certain criteria, New Edition were genuine friends. They grew up together and had similar life experiences and real connections. Insecurities. While growing up, Bobby faced colour prejudice. He was considered less attractive because he was dark skinned. He grew up being insecure and shy about his complexion. He also had bags under his eyes for as long as he could remember. When I looked in the mirror, in my mind, I saw an ugly kid staring back at me, he said. He revealed that this was perpetuated in the group too. He was called ugly by other members of New Edition. He said, quote, as a community, we're slowly starting to get away from our color prejudice but it was still definitely in effect in the 70s and in the 80s. They would call me darky or black or five head because I've always had a big forehead. Even New Edition used to say this stuff 
back when we first formed the group, end quote. Bobby had some real mean things said to him by other members of the group about his appearance and skin complexion. He said Ricky was the worst with the insults, despite actually being of a similar complexion to him. The remarks about his skin tone stopped when Ronnie DeVoe joined the group. He was lighter than all of them, so none of them could say anything about skin tone anymore. They were kids at the time, and this was back in the 80s, so you can imagine how much more of an issue it was. It's not as bad today, although it does still exist. Bobby still dealt with insecurities, despite girls all over the world screaming when he was performing. Despite their arguments, the boys had a great time and got along for the most part. It was one of the best periods of their lives. Getting shot. When Bobby was just 13 years old, he was shot by his girlfriend's crazed ex-boyfriend. He and his girlfriend, Kim, were dancing at a party and having a good time. Her ex showed up and Kim, as well as others, warned Bobby. But he refused to leave. He wasn't scared of anyone, even though the ex was a 17 year old who had just come out of juvie. Kim's ex named Timmy showed up with a gun and began shooting. Bobby ran and soon realized he was the target. He ran as far as he could and managed to escape the danger. But when he stopped at a bus stop to check if it was safe, he saw blood filling up at the bottom of his pant leg. He had been shot in the knee. The bullet went straight through, a clean shot. He didn't even feel any pain, probably because of the shock. But when he hobbled to the nearest hospital, the reality of the situation dawned on him. He didn't even tell his parents until years later. His mother was shocked, as were the others of New Edition when he told them. Thankfully, rather than hinder his ability to dance, Bobby said his dancing improved after his wound healed. This was not the only time he had to dodge bullets. Kim and Bobby went on to have two children together, the Princia and Bobby Jr. He was with Kim on and off, right up until the time he began dating Whitney Houston. Solo career. New Edition's management caused tension in the group. They sowed seeds of discord with Bobby and the other members, basically encouraging them to throw Bobby out of the group. The group he helped create in the first place. At the same time, the management was setting Bobby up to have a solo career. So they had a vested interest in causing division between him and the rest of the group. The trust between them was compromised even though they wanted to be loyal to one another. The parents of the boys would also be at odds with each other at times. Bobby's mother, in particular, pushed them to demand more money, but some of them didn't want to hear it. Bobby went on to have his solo career, and boy, did it take off. If he didn't embark on a solo career, there would be no don't be cruel, no my prerogative, no every little step. Bobby went on to cement himself as a key contributor to the New Jack Swing movement. Whitney Houston would go on to call Bobby the king of R&B. He humbly denies this title, but who else should receive the crown, especially from the 90s era? The rest of New Edition had no choice but to give Bobby his props, acknowledging that he did good and no doubt became one of the stars of the group. For one of their comeback tours, Bobby was able to command $1 million, knowing full well the tour would not be a success without him. He was able to leverage his solo success to earn more than the others. Bobby compared it to Mick Jagger getting paid more than the other members of the Rolling Stones. Naturally, this is to be expected. The others didn't even negotiate payment and were even willing to accept no payment until the next round of tours. They were upset with Bobby for getting $1 million, but they should have been more upset with themselves for not negotiating what they were worth. This was one of the many examples of division within New Edition, but they have sustained a 30-year career more than most groups in popular music. Ups and downs were to be expected, but they are still going strong till this day. Whitney Houston. Bobby and Whitney met at the Soul Train Awards in 1989. Here, Bobby won Album of the Year and was nominated for several other awards. He performed that night to a ruckus crowd. Well, they say I'm crazy. I really don't care. That's my prerogative. While he was sitting in the audience, someone knocked him on the back of the head multiple times. He turned around to find Whitney sitting behind him. He finally confronted her about it. You keep hitting me on the head. To which her response was, I know, classic Whitney. When Bobby performed, he took off his jacket and threw it to the side. After his performance, he went to retrieve the jacket and Whitney had it. She asked if she could keep it and he said yes. They exchanged numbers 
which would have been home numbers back then, and their whirlwind romance began. Bobby was the hottest guy in the industry. He had the dance moves, the bad boy image, and the success. He admits that there was a little crossover between Janet Jackson, who he had dated, and Whitney. There was also a crossover between him and Eddie Murphy, who Whitney was actually dating at the time. Whitney and Janet were complete opposites. Janet was short and curvy. She didn't drink, smoke or cuss. Whitney, on the other hand, was tall and slender, outspoken and cussed a lot. And she happened to smoke the same brands of cigarettes as Bobby. Bobby maintains that his persona in the industry was not the real him. He was humble and given and didn't believe his own hype like many other celebrities. Whitney was at the top of her career when they met. She had seven consecutive number one singles and was on her way to selling 45 million albums worldwide. After a couple of years dating, Bobby asked Whitney's father, John Russell Houston, for her hand in marriage. He straight up asked Bobby how much he earned. After confirming that he too was a millionaire, Whitney's father agreed to the marriage, believing that he didn't have any hidden agenda in marrying her. Bobby proposed to Whitney in Miami, where she was working. She agreed to marry him even after he presented a smaller six carat ring. When she said yes, he presented her with a 20 carat ring. They laughed at the prank and looked forward to the future. Of course, most women would love a six carat ring. Bobby was 23 when he and Whitney married and she was six years older than him. He claims that she allowed him to go to California to sow his wild oats before the wedding to quote, get it out of his system. He had a month long bachelorette party in California before the wedding. I can't go into details about it in this video, but you can imagine. It was on their wedding day when Bobby caught Whitney doing cocaine for the first time. Her brother Michael told him that she was a user, but he had not seen it for himself until that moment. When Whitney's addiction issues came to light, it was Bobby who was blamed. The media and fans assumed it was he who introduced her to hard drugs, but he had always denied it. He said prior to meeting Whitney, his main drug of choice was weed and nothing else. Whitney's brother Michael would later reveal that it was he who in fact introduced her to drugs. He admitted this in an Oprah interview in 2013, a year after his sister's tragic death. Well, you know, for so many years, people thought Bobby Brown was the one who introduced her drugs, but she was already doing drugs by the time she met Bobby Brown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But throughout their marriage, Bobby would be seen as the one leading Whitney astray. Three doves released at Whitney and Bobby's wedding were later found dead, eaten by crows. Many would consider this a bad sign, but Bobby didn't think anything of it. He was too high on drugs at the time to care. From early on in the marriage, Bobby went from dabbling occasionally with hard drugs to doing them every day. It didn't stop after his daughter was born either. They would have staff take care of Bobby Christina while they locked themselves in a room for days doing drugs. They lived in a mansion, so they would go to the other side of the house to do their thing. Bobby admitted that they couldn't completely shield Bobby Christina from what they were doing, and it no doubt affected her. It was not possible for them to be the best parents to her while addicted to drugs. As much as they were two talented, wealthy superstars, they were essentially two people strung out on drugs with a baby to care for. Our daughter saw it all, he said. Bobby made attempts to get off drugs multiple times. During his first time in rehab, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. This is a condition that causes drastic mood swings from manic episodes to deep depression. Substance abuse is prevalent among people with bipolar disorder as they may use drugs to regulate their moods. Bobby was relieved when he was diagnosed because it provided an explanation for the mood swings he had experienced his whole life. He always thought there was something wrong with him, but now he had a diagnosis and knew his condition was due to a chemical imbalance in the brain. He was put on medication to manage the disorder and it helped him a great deal. Bobby also had a few run-ins with the law throughout his marriage to Whitney. In 1996, he was pulled over for driving under the influence. He was charged with resisting arrest for cursing at the police officer. Bobby insists this was the catalyst that eventually led to him going to jail years later. In 2000, he went to prison for parole violation stemming from the DUI. He said, quote, I believe our nation's probation system is a scam 
giving the authorities complete discretion in deciding if and when you have violated your terms. A Florida judge decided that I hadn't completed the 100 hours of community service that were conditions of my parole and that I had violated my probation by attending the Grammys Award in California and traveling to the Bahamas, end quote. These were years after his DUI and Bobby ended up getting arrested after a family vacation. To top it off, he had an incompetent lawyer who reminded him of the stuttering lawyer in My Cousin Vinny. Fourth of this year, my client did indeed uh, visit the Saka Suds. Um, um. He ended up spending 60 something days in prison. He kept his head down and didn't expect any special treatment. This was noticed by the guards and the other inmates, and they ended up really liking him. His cellmate, who was charged with murder, had been granted bail, but Bobby, who was there for a DUI, was denied bail. The discrepancies in the legal system in America were evident, to say the least. When Bobby was released, he paid his cellmates bail money for him. One good thing to come out of being in prison was Bobby had been forced to detox and stop taking drugs. He was no longer addicted and clean from drugs after almost a decade. In 2003, Bobby was arrested for assaulting Whitney. He admitted it, but said it was the first and last time he ever laid a hand on her. Not that that makes it okay. Going to court is when the world was introduced to the Real Housewives of Atlanta star, Phaedra Parks. Although she did a better job than the My Cousin Vinny lawyer, he noticed that she was all about the limelight. There was always press at his court cases, so much so that he complained about it to her. Bobby confirmed that whenever Phaedra represented him, he would always end up losing his case and going down. On the Red Table Talk episode, Bobby revealed that he has been clean of narcotics for a whopping 19 years. When he got out of prison in 1995, he started his journey to sobriety. So when he was being blamed for encouraging Whitney's habit, he was in fact clean and off drugs. However, he admitted that he simply substituted one addiction for another and began to have a drinking problem. As of 2021, Bobby has been sober for a year. He gave up alcohol, when he realised the effects it was having on his health, his marriage and relationships. He described shaking and having numb limbs until he had had his first drink of the day. He wasn't drinking recreationally. He was drinking to feel normal. He was drinking to survive. All the while, the alcohol was killing him. His wife Alicia insisted he get help if there was to be any hope for them. And of course, he wanted to be the father his children deserved. Losing Bobby Christina was a hard lesson to accept, proving that the cycle of addiction could harm those we love the most. Bobby said Whitney doing drugs would cause tension and they would argue relentlessly. When they got into that altercation, it was allegedly over Whitney letting her drug dealer into the house. Whitney stood by him and refused to press charges. His charge was eventually reduced to a misdemeanor. We got to see Whitney and Bobby reunited when he was released from jail after another parole violation on his reality show, Being Bobby Brown. Many found the show amusing and loved the dynamic between Bobby and Whitney. They didn't disappoint, for sure. Go, 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 go to get my, my, my glasses, glasses, glasses. Do you like Mom, these on Mom, me? Mom, I think these are tight, Mom. but they get down. They work, they work for me, they work. Bobby said, not only was it fun to do, it was therapy to us. The show gave some insight into their somewhat troubled dynamic. It also shed light into what a young Bobby Christina had to deal with at times. Bobby's sister Leola, who worked as an assistant for the couple when Chrissy was around 11 years old, said, they loved Chrissy intensely. She was well cared for, she was protected. I read things where people were saying she was neglected and that couldn't have been further from the truth. Even when they were caring for her themselves, they had a full staff of people on hand to take care of her every need." End quote. Bobby took time out of his career to support Whitney when they first got married. He saw that her financial affairs were not what they seemed. He said Whitney was unaware of what she should be earning. Her team wasn't clear about certain aspects of her finances. He didn't miss a thing. 
He even spoke to Clive Davis and questioned aspects of her contracts. He ended up getting her more money as a result. Contrary to how he was portrayed in the media, Bobby was not after her money. He maintains that when they first got together, he was doing better than she was financially. And all he wanted to do was protect her, in particular from the snakes she had in her own team. As well as physical abuse, drugs and press intrusion, affairs also plagued the marriage. Bobby admits to cheating, but said Whitney did her fair share of cheating too. He never named names, except for Tupac Shakur. Bobby maintains that it was Whitney who first strayed. He said, quote, We were together in September 1996, when we found out that Tupac had been killed. Whitney bawled her eyes out, crying for days over his death. Her tears were painful for me because I knew what that meant. My wife was mourning the passing of a lover, end quote. When their marriage came to an end, Bobby didn't ask for anything. He said he left with a thousand dollars and the will to start over again, building his career from the ground up, dodging bullets again. In 1995, Bobby went back to his old neighborhood in Roxbury. He and his friends went to a club, but his friend and future brother-in-law, Stephen, was denied entry because he had no ID. Instead of accepting this, Stephen decided to give the bouncer a beating. Needless to say, he and Bobby had to leave immediately. A couple of nights later, they decided to return to the club. Bobby decided to use his status to do some good in his community. There was a huge issue of rival gangs beefing and killing each other. Bobby decided he wanted to address this. Gangs from the same hood were fighting each other and he couldn't understand why. He gave an impassioned speech at this gathering. He was no Martin Luther King, but he got his message across and he spoke from the heart. Bobby and Stephen were leaving the club in his cream-coloured Bentley when suddenly shots were fired towards the vehicle they were in. Stephen was shot in the head and was killed instantly. Bobby hid under the steering wheel as shots continued. He pulled Stephen down towards him, but it was too late. He opened the door on the passenger side and slowly slipped down to the ground. He heard the shooter's gun make a noise that indicated it was out of bullets. He got up and ran for his life. He survived, but he did get grazed by a bullet. Stephen was engaged to Bobby's sister. She didn't speak to him for years after the incident. The person responsible for the murder was caught and convicted. After this, Bobby's sister began to speak to him again and their relationship slowly healed. The incident wasn't his fault, but the hurt was just too much. 2011 was a very difficult year for Bobby. His mother passed away from a sudden heart attack. She was 69 years old. Just 11 months later, his father died from lung cancer. Because of his father's diagnosis, he and his siblings had prepared themselves for the worse. But when he was asked to come to the hospital, Bobby was shocked beyond belief when he was told that it was his mother who had passed away that day. Whitney came to his mother's funeral even though they were no longer together. She gave a speech, sang, and made it clear to Bobby's new girlfriend that she was Carol's daughter-in-law and always will be. Bobby appreciated her showing up, especially because she brought his daughter, Bobby Christina, who he hadn't seen much of since the divorce. It hurt his heart not seeing his daughter for so long. The divorce was very hard on Chrissy, and she was devastated when her father moved on with Alicia who was Bobby's childhood friend. According to Bobby, Whitney and the Houstons spoke very badly of him to Chrissy, so she thought it was all his fault and that her father didn't care for her. While in town for the funeral, Bobby, Chrissy and her other siblings hung out. Chrissy spent the day with her father and her baby brother. Later that evening, she went out with her other siblings. It was a great day and Bobby had finally reconnected with his daughter. Sadly, that was one of the last times they were all together. A few months after the trauma of losing his parents, just when he was beginning to get back to performing, he received a call that stopped him dead in his tracks. Whitney had died. When Bobby found out about Whitney's death, his first thought was to be with his daughter, Bobby Christina. He was on tour with New Edition at the time. Many of us remember him addressing Whitney's death while on stage. Fans questioned why he was on stage 
and not on the first plane out to LA to be with his daughter. But Bobby, who was in Mississippi, spoke with her on the phone and he said that she was incoherent. He immediately called his brother Tommy and told him to rush to the hotel. When Tommy arrived, he found Chrissy among a sea of celebrities, including Ray J and Monica. The Grammys were in town and the Grammys party that Whitney was supposed to attend was filling up with celebrities who had heard the news. This was very strange, until this day, very disturbing. The party continued while Whitney's body was still in the hotel close by. According to Tommy, Chrissy seemed pretty out of it and kept asking for someone named Nick, referring to him as her brother. Tommy thought she was hallucinating or something because she didn't have a brother named Nick. Then she explained that he lived with her and Whitney. That was the first time he had heard of Nick Gordon. Reports said that Bobby Christina was rushed to the hospital during this time. Most assumed that she was overcome by stress and grief, but Tommy revealed he is the one who called the ambulance because he thought she had taken something. And he inferred that it was Nick Gordon who gave her some sort of substance. She was totally out of it after she had briefly met with him and he left. Tommy vowed to not let her out of his sight that night and took her to a hotel to recuperate and left her in the care of her siblings while he went on to investigate what was going on. Her older sister, LaPrincia, said Bobby Christina was ushered away by the Houstons without her knowledge. She thought she was in the shower. Bobby has always maintained that the Houstons fought to keep Bobby Christina away from him. She changed her number multiple times and he didn't even get to see her at Whitney's funeral, as they instructed their security to keep him away from her. At the funeral, Bobby's other children were allegedly told to move from the second row. They were told to sit further back away from Bobby and Chrissy behind a bunch of celebrities who weren't even family. He famously walked out of the funeral and never returned. He said it was because he didn't want his kids being disrespected like that and left without him while grieving. His children were even referred to as his entourage when everyone knew who they were. Bobby Christina and his unimaginable loss. Just three months after Whitney's death, Bobby saw his daughter on a reality show. Her grief displayed and exploited for the whole world to see. He revealed that Bobby Christina said she only agreed to do the show because she thought she wouldn't have enough money. Bobby claimed in his book that his daughter never received the $10 million put aside for her to receive at the age of 21 from her mother's estate. Whitney's sister-in-law, Pat Houston, is the executor of the estate and was behind the reality show. He said Whitney's brother Michael and his wife Pat are not even Houstons. Michael and Whitney had different fathers and his real name is Garland. They only changed their names to capitalise off the famous Houston name. Bobby blamed the Houstons and Nick Gordon for keeping Chrissy away from him. He said, One time, when they were supposedly in LA, I went to the Beverly Wiltshire, thinking I was about to see my daughter. I called her, and he, Nick Gordon, answered the phone, claiming they were on the way downstairs. I waited in the lobby. Nobody ever showed up. I found out they weren't even staying there. Whatever game he was playing, I had a growing sense of dread about what was happening to my daughter." End quote. At one point, he wasn't even sure where they were living, and the Houstons were funding their frequent moves, according to Bobby. The last time he hung out with his daughter, Bobby Christina, was on Father's Day 2014. She came to meet her father while he was in town with New Edition. She even spoke to Bobby's new wife, Alicia, finally showing acceptance of the marriage and bonding with her baby brother. They embraced and were thrilled to see each other. That was the first time they had spent any real time together in several years. It was the happiest he had seen her in a long while. Chrissy posted pictures of their meeting on Instagram, much to the delight of fans. The love between father and daughter was evident and very touching. They were in contact after that and spoke regularly. She even came to his concert. They started to rebuild their relationship. There were even signs that she was considering breaking away from Nick. Bobby Christina Brown died on the 26th of July 2015 after being in a coma for six months. She was found unresponsive face down in a bathtub at her Atlanta townhouse. She was just 22. It was three years 
after the death of her mother, who died in eerily similar circumstances. Bobby is adamant that Nick Gordon was abusing his daughter. He believes he was the common denominator in both the death of Whitney and Chrissy. Okay. He was the only one there with both uh, situations, with my ex-wife and with my daughter, and they both died the same way. While Chrissy was in hospital fighting for her life, Bobby reflected on his time as a father and asked himself how he had come to this. Quote, How much did our behaviour, the drugs, the time I spent locked away from her, contribute to what she had become? Were there things that she saw in the way I treated her mother that made her more likely to stay in what I knew had to be an abusive relationship? In 2016, Nick was deemed legally responsible for the death of Bobby Christina. After he failed to appear in court, he was ordered to pay $36 million for her wrongful death. Bobby and his wife, Alicia, set up the Bobby Christina Serenity House in honour of Chrissy's memory. On their website, it says, We seek to fulfil our goal to provide 24-hour crisis intervention, emergency transitional shelter, access to resources, referral services and advocacy for social change with expert support services for victims and survivors of domestic violence. We are committed to eliminating the epidemic of domestic violence and oppression against male and females of all ages by changing the current beliefs and institutions which encourage violence. We seek to give a voice to the voiceless. Bobby Brown Jr. Bobby confirmed that it was drugs that took the life of his second born, his son, Bobby Brown Jr. His death was announced last year and it came as a devastating shock. Yet another tragedy faced by Bobby and his family. Bobby Jr. was not a regular user and Bobby believes he simply decided to try drugs and it was that time that proved fatal. And, and let me get it, make it clear. He wasn't a, he wasn't a user. Oh, he, okay. he would experiment with different things. Got it. Um, it wasn't like he was dependent on drugs. Like when I was yeah. in my situation, mm -hmm. I depended. I yeah. needed. It. He was a young man that tried the wrong stuff, and um, it took him out of here. Bobby Brown Jr. contributed to his father's 2016 memoirs, describing what it was like to be the son of one of the most iconic R&B singers of the 80s and 90s. He too was a singer, and he was determined to create his own path. Bobby Jr. and Chrissy were close when they were kids. They were only a year apart. However, they saw less and less of each other after Whitney and Bobby's divorce. They went several years without speaking properly after that. Bobby Jr. had a hard time dealing with his blended family at first. He said he felt that Whitney didn't like him, especially because his father got his mother pregnant while he and Whitney were together. It messed him up finding out that a paternity test was demanded when he was born. When he visited his dad and Whitney, Whitney would call him Robert. This upset him because he felt that they were trying to replace him as his sister was called Bobby. He was born first, so he couldn't understand why she would not call her daughter Chrissy. Nobody called him Robert unless he was in trouble. Looking at it from his perspective as a young boy, you could see why he felt that way. But I'm sure Whitney loved him, especially because he was Bobby's son. While speaking about his father, he said, in words that are now quite haunting, people can say, I have big shoes to fill, but I have my own shoes to fill. I'm building my own legacy. His legacy is great. Mine will be great too. I won't allow myself to make the mistakes my father made because I learned from them. I thank him for that. Being able to learn from him, not just in a positive way, every time I do music, every day I wake up to better myself as an artist and a man, he said. Yeah. He was a musician, played piano, played drums. He was a great writer. Mm -hmm. He was a teacher and learner. Right. Know? It is a tragic loss, but there's hope in that his sudden death will save lives as people are made aware of the dangers. Hopefully, this will make others think twice before deciding to dabble in drugs. It only takes one time. 
It was a relief to see Bobby holding up and getting through his trauma in the best way he possibly can. He has a supportive wife, children who love him, and no doubt, fans who are happy to see him back. Many can learn not to repeat the patterns that have played out in his life so publicly. He said he put on weight when he gave up drugs, but one day he'll be back. His fans wish him the best. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts below. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And don't forget to click the bell for more.